Um, I have had a reasonably traumatic morning. Uh, be just as I was sort of emerging out of sleep, um, there was a voice outside my door, which rather irritated me, if I must be honest with you. Um, um, well, the long and the short of it was that somebody in the community had died last night in her sleep. Um, she is, let's call it psychologically marginalized, um, and has had great difficulty in continuing with her family. She has a very vulnerable little girl who seems to be going down the same road. And it was a, it was a strange experience this morning. As I left my room, walked out of, to the back where we've got rooms uh, that were apparently half funded by the United Nations, came into her room and there she lay in absolute silence. And it was a very strange moment to move from there to go to her little girl and to tell her that her mother was dead. Finally, the Department of Social Development have got their way. They've managed to remove her mother from her daughter. I then needed to go and see a woman in the community who has been um, basically in a very abusive relationship. Um, she's uh, quite disabled from an accident and her uh, boyfriend, who quite sensitively puts all sorts of other pictures of his interactions with women on his Facebook page, and I needed to reconcile with her because the last time I was with her I was so angry about her perpetuating victimhood about her and not telling him in, well, I better not use theological language, to make a sexual departure. I then had to meet with uh, four young people who are busy with their O-levels and I got an SMS during the week to say that they hadn't attended classes on Tuesday to find out exactly why they hadn't attended classes and then I had to come here. And why I've spoken about that is because I, what I fundamentally have done, I feel much better now. Uh, <laughs> Um, as, as you could sense while I was speaking, I managed to get a bit angry again about the death because it's so tragic um, about the abuse of this woman, about really what our nation is about, which is the journey of relationship. And perhaps to... to be as brief as I possibly can. In March this year, I had two people come to me and say to me, can't you open hearings? Um, that was on a Wednesday, and on the Friday, I attended the Church Unity Commission meetings uh, in Johannesburg, and I have been given a portfolio by the Church Unity Commissions of crea creating places of hope, which kind of gives me um, an irresponsible mandate, considering what my personality is, to work wherever I can in the country. But it has been phenomenal. And I want to give you some insights, because there's no specific bureaucratic mold to the thing, but it's beginning to start opening up possibilities. 
Sometimes we believe that the only people who can do therapy are psychologists, psychiatrists, and ministers. Sometimes we embalm in our religious communities, and I'm speaking across the board, we embalm our potential in singing and praying and preaching and all that very important stuff which completely at some times disables the entire movement of faith. Am I making sense? Yep. Now, it must sound very strange for me, but frankly, there are times when I am hutful of my own life commitment. And, and I, one wants to say, you know, I, I've got tremendous patience. I'm, I'm a teacher. I've got tremendous patience if I don't communicate properly with my learners and they struggle to grasp what I'm trying to say. I will sit with them, explain it to them and so on. But it's with the very gifted learners that are so arrogant that they are impenetrable that I am the most vicious. The church, for instance, the mosques, for instance, sit with the most unbelievable potential, especially in this nation. You have heard diagnosis. You have heard criticism. You have heard all sorts of stuff. That is exactly where the church belongs. I'm Christian, so forgive me for using the paradigm. I don't think that Jesus' walk through Jerusalem was a walk in the park. This morning I read about a woman who was possessed and crippled. And it was a Sabbath day. And so in actual fact, you shouldn't do healing on a Sabbath day because it's work. Well, what is the work? Am I making sense? Am I making sense? What on earth divides us as Christians is beyond our refined intelligence. I think it is power. I think it is property and money. I think it is having to sit in front. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody can force you to do it if you don't want to. <laughs> you, can, you won't. <laughs> Are you with me, people? And so I suppose part of what I want to say to you today is every single one of you has got the potential of being a living expression of faith. It is not confined to people who wear dog collars, have gone to theological college. Those things are very important. I've been involved with that kind of nonsense for a long time. But every single one of you has definitely got a ministry. So for instance, we've now opened the hearings. And we've opened hearings in every province except um, the Northern Cape. I'm beginning to wangle my way into people there that I'm wanting to start them up with. And it's with a very peculiar mix of people. So um, some of them are politicians, some of them are social workers, some of them are psychologists, some of them are very religious, and we've also started hearings on Gugurawundi. 
Well, not just Gugaraundi. Gugaraundi, Marambatswina, xenophobia, everything that relates to Zimbabweans. And, and let me just say, for instance, in the Western Cape, we have Bram Fisher's daughter, who's a psychologist, and a trustworthy social worker who's so wonderfully anally retentive in her organizing that she just gets everything on time. You know what social workers are like. Sorry if you're a social worker. <laughs> but you understand what I mean. Social workers have got the ability to ask the questions that make the difference, that shift bad habits. And Di Oliver does an incredible job in pulling together theologians and spiritual ethicists and all sorts of people and they've done a hearing on that very traumatic crumb dry thing that happened in the Western Cape and they've tried to intervene in the stuff that's happening in Fishhook and so that's the personality of where that's going at the moment. In the Eastern Cape, um, and, and let me just say, what is interesting about the hearings is you may go into a hearing that is, you know, anybody who needs to talk of any trauma that you've been through that might relate to service delivery, labor disputes, uh, the violation of human rights in terms of woman abuse, child abuse, it might relate to issues concerning land. It might concern whatever. In the Eastern Cape, for instance, uh, we've been involved in a service delivery dispute that I've spoken about before in Kirkwood. In 2013, the municipality had a 22 million surplus after expenditure. 2014, 84,5 million rand needing to be written off. 2015, so far, 32,9 million unauthorized expenditure. So you can begin to see it takes you into corruption and into all sorts of stuff relating to individuals. A man who gets taken into custody on alleged charges of public violence, he wasn't actually even there when the public violence took place, went into custody, what happened to him in prison left him in my presence with another counsellor in tears. Was he sexually abused? How was he violated to the point at which when he sat in front of us, he was in brokenness? Another hearing, I meet a young woman of 30 years of age. Her father was butchered to death by the security police in 1985. Her mother says to me, won't you please come and speak to her because I'm not sure of what's going on. And I sit with her and she says, I've never seen my father. But you know, I had a dream. But people don't take my dream seriously. She tells me the dream of her father. And I say to her, tell me, because I knew he's her father. Tell me what you saw. What did he look like? What did his voice sound like? And she begins to formulate her father. And she says, I want to meet the man who did what he did to my father so that I can ask him to his eyes, what did you do? And I can have the right to say, I'm not going to forgive you or I am going to forgive you for my own freedom. Let's go to Natal. And in Natal, 
The hearings are housed by Diaconia Council of Churches and the Dennis Hurley Center for Reconciliation. They have done some of the most exquisite work and most of the concentration there has been on the xenophobia. That doesn't mean that eventually Natal is not going to get into the conflict between the um, Inkata Freedom Party and ANC violence that, did, that took place in our transition. But let me tell you one of the things. Some of the therapists go and meet with some of the Somalians who have experienced the xenophobia. And you know what they do? They bring a pile of um, national geographicals. And they say, take two or three of these, look through the pictures, cut out the pictures that you, mean, you need that relate to you, and create a collage and come and tell your story. And from the people speaking, the most phenomenal stuff has been ventilated and healed. But I'm sorry to have to tell you, unfortunately those two people are both pretty close to 80, so they're pretty useless. If you hear what I'm saying. You might be a young girl of 30 years of age, but you must know that you can be used to create a new beginning in the imagination of someone else. The rest of arrogant South Africa might think that when once you reach the age of 65, really you should be retired because there's very little else that you can do. But you might just hold the key because of the experiences of your life that might unlock a trap a prison in which somebody has sat forever. Not one of you is irrelevant. Not one of you. Some of the therapists went to the perpetrators and you know what they did? They collected, they collected footage of what had happened in Somalia that had driven the people out of Somalia and they showed that footage at the beginning of the therapeutic intervention and the people said, why have we not seen this? If we had known. If we had known. Went to Bloemfontein and, and met with people in Bloemfontein. Actually, in the Tuaturenkerk in, in Bloemfontein where there is a kind of interesting partnership. Now listen to this. Interesting partnership between the Dutch Reformed Church and the Anglican Church in their working together and in speaking through. And, and I, I was sitting there with skilled, skilled, skilled counselors, afraid that they shouldn't really start the work until the church authorities of all everybody had been, con and I said to them, for heaven's sake, don't wait for the church to get itself into gear. Just do it. Just do it. Organize yourselves and do it. Come together on a regular basis so that you can account to one another, so that you can debrief one another, because you are going to hear stuff that is going to distress you profoundly. And unless you find yourselves as wounded healers, you're going to become a liability. And so I'll go back in a month's time and see just what they have done and haven't. And you know, you can hear from my style that if they haven't got moving, God will help them. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yesterday, I was in the muddy, well, in the platinum belt. Now, I wonder if I can risk this. The, the, the people who help me in the platinum belt are the EFF, to be frank. Yesterday, they took me to Machau which is a, quite a pretty village with mines all over the place operating illegally. 
And the village is wanting to stop the mines from operating until they start recognizing the imperative that is part of the constitution of this country that no mining may take place where you just go in, rape the land and the community and then leave when you finished. But the government has got in its constitution what they call, those of you who know, SLPs, social labor plans. And you are supposed to plow back into the community something that enables the community to begin to start living with dignity. There are 138 informal settlements in Muddy Beng. Fortunately, you know, Chwane has only got 145 informal settlements in the city of Chwane. I discovered that last week. And so some of these hearings then take me into the offices of the municipality to sit with the councillors and to start asking, now forgive me, I live in Soweto, come from Johannesburg. I drive into Johannesburg, the city that's built on gold. I see the development of an economy that is not imprisoned in the mines. And I go into the Rustenburg area where platinum this week was selling between $989 and $995 per fine ounce. And the conditions that the workers are living in, with due respect people, is absolutely unacceptable in every respect. In every respect. Majakaneng has been there for 20 years. They still don't have running water. And when the water does get delivered, it's usually contaminated. There are, there are no early childhood development things. You go to another place in the northwest, Clarksdorp, you know, those places. There are children of the age of five being co-opted into gangs. Now, people, let me say to you, we've got huge, huge challenges. But don't think that you have sat in church year after year after year for nothing, because you are now ready to meet the challenges. Thank you.